Linux Luddites, episode 92, the 28th of November, 2016. And welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Paddy. And I'm Jesse. And we have a classic show for you today, guys. We've got the news up front, of course. Uh, Joe and I then look at our Raspberry Pis that we use around the house and discuss how we have them set up. We have your feedback. And at the end, we look at Chapeau Linux. And that's French for hat, so it might give you a clue as to what it's based on. But before that, has either of you been spending big in the Black Friday sales? Black Friday? Isn't that some sort of American thing? We don't have that here. Yeah, it's, it's strangely come over to our shores. But uh, no, neither have I. I've been trying to save some, save some cash. Yeah, and I've not been splashing out this weekend, but a couple of weeks back I went and uh, bought myself an early birthday and Christmas present, which was an SSD. Wow, welcome to this century, Paddy. <laughs> So every time we talk about hard disks, Joe and I say, you won't believe the difference, you won't believe the difference. So have you believed the difference? I have now believed the difference. Um, I put it off for a very long time because the machine it was going in, which is my main machine, is an old ThinkPad X200. And I wasn't sure how much difference it would make, to be honest, because it's got a fairly slow, obviously, SAS connection and a slow CPU. It's a Core 2 Duo. Um, so I wasn't totally convinced. but. My eyes have been opened. And I see there's a whole load of uh, stats and outputs on speed and stuff in the show notes. So what have you used to test the comparison between what your old hard disk was like and what the new one's like? Yeah, before I did this, um, I ran FIO, I think it is, um, and I got you two to do so on your machines to see what the sort of speed difference was. And raw uh, 4K RAM read tests, uh, I used to get 106 input-output operations per second, on my old hard disk, which wasn't a particularly nasty hard disk. It was a Western Digital, but it was only running at 5,400. And now I'm getting um, about 4,500 high up, so that's about a 40 times speed up. Now, obviously, that doesn't translate into a 40 times speed up for everything you do, but the difference is quite um, impressive, to be honest. I mean, for instance, booting to a stable Ubuntu 16.04 desktop, which is where I spend most of my time in, including uh, the Dropbox client, used to take 100 seconds on this machine um, consistently. It was uh, around that time, and that's dropped down to 15 seconds now. So that's, that's a marked difference. Yeah, can you see why I don't bother with suspend now? No, I can't, because we, we chatted about this previously. Um, and whilst I can see why you might want to do that, my machine's actually running hotter than it used to, so I like to give it a little bit of a breather, simply because it's now not waiting for the disk. It clearly was waiting for disk access in the past, and that's what I've always assumed for the amount the disk light was going. Um, but it isn't having to do that now. And another quick stat for people, uh, boot into a stable Windows 10 desktop, including my Dropbox and uh, Google Drive clients, used to take 190 seconds. That's over three minutes, and that's down to 45 seconds now. Three minutes? <laughs> God, dear. It's, it's, I can't believe it's taken this long to get an SSD. And it's funny you should actually have this on this show because for the review we're doing later, uh, I had some problems installing it on my laptop. So I just got a spare old hard drive out, put it in with my desktop and installed straight to that. And that's a spinning drive. And I haven't used a hard drive in my in my main machine that's spinning in a year, year or two. And it, it was significantly slow it was it was surprising how much slower it was and i i sort of thought oh maybe it's just because it's a, a gnome 3 desktop might be but it, i use gnome 3 all day long and so i'm used to how fast it should be so as joe said it's uh definitely the way forward and welcome to the 21st century well thank you it was something that struck me quite early on in sort of experimenting with this i'm gonna have to make serious allowances for it when we're looking at things like uh different desktops because not everybody has one of these things. I mean, this was only 60 quid, the one I bought for a, a 3D one, a, a 275 gigabyte one. So it's, it's reasonably priced and obviously it does make a big difference even on an old machine, which is something I was curious about. But not everybody does have them. And things like GNOME, which we're going to be looking at later on in the show, actually behaved 
like a, a usable desktop, which it never has done before on this machine. So I am going to have to sort of temper my judgments on uh, desktop environments going forwards, I think, and just try and bear in mind that not everybody is in the same position. Well, it's funny that my main test machine is uh, a Sony Vio, which is about as powerful as your ThinkPad, I think, Paddy. And that did have an SSD in it, which I gave to my wife to replace a spinning drive in her laptop. And I thought, oh, I'll just stick a spinning drive in it, it'll be fine. But after about two weeks, I just I couldn't deal with it anymore. I had to buy an SSD to put in it because once you go SSD, you never go back, not if you've got any choice. Well, it looks like Paddy tried the new stuff and it's better than the old. So we'll leave it there. Let's get on with the news. So first up then, the Fedora project is pleased to announce the immediate availability of Fedora 25. Has someone been listening to System AU by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Stop plugging them. They're getting plugged everywhere at the moment. Um, the next big step in our journey into the containerized modular future, according to fedoramagazine.org. And so you've got the three versions that you used to have, except they've changed one of them. So Fedora Workstation is just the desktop one that we are familiar with, which is GNOME 3.2.2 um, and sort of... Uh, just more of the same really updated things with uh one slight difference that it's got the wayland display server instead of x as default now which is quite a big step forward isn't it yeah they've been promising slash threatening to have this out for a good number of releases now and it always seems to slip and not quite get there to be the uh, the default but here it is uh, as either of you spun it up i attempted to install it so i spun up the live version and then it couldn't see any of my partitions apart from the two windows ones because you when you install i've got windows 10 just for i don't know i haven't booted into it for a long time but you get the little um like boot partition that's a couple of hundred megabytes and then the main one and so i could see those but it couldn't see any other other ones and so i didn't want to nuke my windows one so i wasn't able to install it unfortunately but otherwise it just looked like fedora to me which is a shame because I wanted to check out video playback and, and whether tearing goes away. I've heard really good things about Wayland and it seemed to be working fine, even with the um, ATI card in, in this drive. So I was really looking forward to it. And um, so I am think I'm going to have to give it another go at some point. And this is the one that's supposed to support MP3 playback out of the box, isn't it? Yeah, we talked about that last time, didn't we? And I, I can't say I noticed it on the live session, but I probably would have done if I'd uh, if I'd installed it. Okay, so you covered Fedora Workstation, and there's two more releases, aren't there? Yeah, Fedora Server, which is pretty much as you would expect, just sort of headless and... <laughs> Sorry. What? So it's like headless chickens, isn't it? I can yeah. imagine a Fedora Server being just like a headless chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose the sysadmin having to reinstall it every six months, although you can update it, upgrade it to some extent. But it, it seems, and I don't really know much about Fedora Server, but looking at what's available for it, it's just sort of everything slightly updated, really. There's no there's no major kind of flagship features, nothing as extreme as Wayland on the desktop version. Um, and there's also Fedora Atomic, which used to be called Cloud. And this is for containers and stuff, basically. It's, it's like the server version, but slightly smaller and more portable, I think, is the sort of take home from it i got the impression it was a bit like ubuntu core where you get the absolute minimum install and then everything you put on it is containerized in in its own little sandbox is that right as far as i know yeah but it does beg the question why you would use fedora server or atomic when you've got centos which is supported for a longer time i suppose you want the latest features and stuff but it sort of doesn't really go with the ethos of this show does it i think more relevant is Something we talked about previously that I believe Red Hat are actually giving people free versions of Pucker Red Hat now, as long as you can sort of claim to be developer. So although that obviously won't be as up to date, I mean, the main reason people tend to like Fedora on the desktop is it's a familiar environment, apart from all the new and shiny bits that break. So I don't know. I mean, that feeds back into the question of user numbers, doesn't it? And I don't know if you guys saw the comments from Richard Brown from OpenSUSE. Yeah, claiming to have a larger user base at the, the the staggeringly high 600,000, which means that Fedora has fewer than that, which I, I, I don't know. I'd kind of pictured more than that somehow. 
Yeah, it's very hard to know because if you actually go and look on the Fedora website, they used to give you uh, sort of sensible statistics about the number of times the human repositories were being accessed. And they stopped doing that a while back. I think it was back with uh, Beefy Miracle thereafter. They've sort of hidden those numbers away. So no one's got a sensible idea of the actual user base out there apart from the project. And they're obviously not keen to share. Makes you wonder how many people are using Ubuntu. I think it's 20 million, isn't it? Every time they tell us. <laughs> 200 million. It's about no, how many it's TVs? 20 million, I'm sure it's. <laughs> anyway, we're rat in this and we don't want to talk too much about Fedora because it's going to rear its ugly head again later in the show. So, Jesse. It's beautiful head, Paddy. It's beautiful head. Come okay, on. sorry. Jesse, move it on, please. Okay, let's, let's drag it back to, uh, to, to the main news. So, Steam Machines was sort of uh, a bit of a poster child for Linux because it was going to come out and potentially compete with the PS4 and the Xbox One. However, while a few years ago it seemed to be in the headlines a lot and it was going to be released and all these different um, companies were lining up to make Steam Machines ready for your lounge, it sort of petered out and we haven't heard very much. And there's an interview with Frank Azor from Alienware and he sort of says that Basically, at the time that Valve announced the Steam Machine and the Steam Controllers, Windows 8 was, you know, on all the laptops and PCs, and it was really not friendly for Windows gamers. So people like Alienware were looking for an alternative that they could still have desktop games uh, supported through Steam, because most of them are, are through there. It looked like a really good way of going to sort of hedge their bets in case Microsoft really did screw over the, the gamer base. However... With the Steam controller being delayed for so long and with Windows 10 being much improved for gamers, even Alienware are sort of saying, well, there's not really that much point in pursuing the Steam machines. And so, you know, this is probably why Steam machines was such a big item and now is, you know, barely talked about anymore. Yeah, the, the whole Steam OS and Steam machines and Steam controller thing was just a bet hedge from Valve, wasn't it? They couldn't take the risk that people would move away from pc gaming and so they they had to have some backup plan but the point of a backup plan is to not need to use that backup plan if you know what i mean and so they're sticking with windows which is tried and tested and so it's not a huge surprise that when windows 10 came out and was less horrible than windows 8 we've talked previously on the show i think about how there were concerns that they were going to go for the kind of app store model where you weren't free to install whatever you wanted. And that could have seriously hindered installing Steam and, and that kind of thing. Whereas Windows 10 came out and although there is an app store type, I can't, I can't even remember what it's called now in Windows 10, you can just download any old EXE and run it like you always have been able to do. And so why bother investing loads of money into steam os when you've got windows 10 which is a perfectly functional gaming platform that everyone who is serious about gaming on pcs uses because even the people who are really into freedom and care loads about open source they're not going to use steam os anyway are they because although it's based on linux and debian and everything all the steam stuff's proprietary so there's not even really much of an incentive there so it it just seems that SteamOS is basically irrelevant unless it performs better than Windows. This is what I always say, that if you have got a situation where games that will run on either Windows or SteamOS perform better on SteamOS, then that's going to attract gamers potentially. But from what I've seen, that isn't really the case. And so yet again, there's just no way to argue the relevance of SteamOS. Yeah, talking about the the freedom lovers, you've also got that problem where if you want the fastest frame rates, a lot of the drivers and things are these proprietary drivers. You know, if you want the the NVIDIA ones that are from the manufacturer, they're all proprietary. So it just goes to sort of compound the problem. So I, I do wonder whether Valve are going to sort of really start backing off with the Steam machine. I mean, we haven't really heard a lot about it recently. They might even sort of shut it down. So the only outcome in the sort of grand scheme of things would be that a nice controller has come out or quite a unique controller has come out which works really well on Linux because, you know, they were trying to base their operating system on Linux. Obviously, all the drivers and everything are in the kernel. So we actually have, out of nowhere, got this uh, bespoke controller. One silver lining, I suppose. Well, 
let's move it on. And it kind of escaped your attention that Microsoft's recently joined the Linux Foundation as a Platinum member. And that's the highest level of membership on offer and one that costs a cool half a million dollars a year. And in doing so, they've joined Cisco, Fujitsu, HP Enterprise, Huawei, IBM, Intel, NEC, Oracle, Qualcomm, and Samsung at that level, um, leaving supposedly more Linux-focused companies like Red Hat languishing and contributing an order of magnitude less. You say contributing an order of magnitude less, but that's only financially, as you know, for the Linux Foundation. I'm sure Red Hat are contributing far more useful code and commits and things than some of those other big companies you named. It's just that they don't make as much money as those massive companies. Absolutely, yeah. And as been pointed out by a number of folks, including Simon Phipps, I mean, the half a million dollars is equivalent to about a quarter of 1% of the amount of money that Microsoft receives from companies um, by way of their shakedown they do on patent disputes, um, claiming that Linux infringes on several patents that Microsoft holds. And it's about the same, um, the patent shakedown, the value they get from it as Red Hat's entire turnover. So that sort of just gets to the point you're making there, Jesse, that not only from a code point of view, but also from a sheer organisational size point of view, we're talking about two totally different sorts of beasts here. Well, yeah, you talk about the size of the organisation, and I think I always say that similar things when we talk about Microsoft and Open Source and Linux. You've got some departments of Microsoft that are really committed to Linux and Open Source, and then you've got other departments that don't care at all and want to, as you say, shake down Linux vendors. And that's the thing. When you get a company of that size, it's not a straightforward thing. You're not really talking about one company because it's certainly not one set of people. It's this giant organization that often is at odds with itself. Yeah, well, speaking about departments, who is it that Microsoft have put forward to be the, the interface between the Linux Foundation and Microsoft? Oh, it was that guy from Azure, wasn't it? Exactly. It's the guy from Azure, which I think shows you their view on where Linux is useful and why it's useful. is because they're being left behind in the cloudy cloud server space, and they're struggling to keep up. So this is obviously the only sort of area that they really do love Linux and why they have had to love Linux. And which, you know, echoes your point there, Joe, about yes, Azure is trying to get on board with open source, things like this, but there are other, you know, many other departments within Microsoft who, you know, turn a blind eye or couldn't really care. Well, you say that this Azure thing is their attempt to stop failing in the cloud and server space. And, and that's why they love Linux. Well, they also love Linux in um, mobile, don't they? Because even though they failed with Windows Phone, they're still making $2 billion, and that's conservative estimates, a year out of Android. And, and that is Linux in mobile. So no wonder they love Linux. But speaking of cloud and, and servers and Linux and Microsoft, SQL Server on Linux. Now, we've talked about that before. It's still in beta. And you've linked, Paddy, to this uh, article in the register where Tim Anderson's had a look at it. And without going into too much detail, it's an ugly hack, isn't it? That's the, the kind of only real way to say it. That how it is working is just sort of typical Windows built on sand, fudge it together and hope it works. Or am I being a bit harsh there? I think you're being really harsh there, to be honest. I mean, what Joe's talking about is there appears to be parts of the NT kernel attached to this, um, and it's doing some call translation so it's not compiled natively for linux this this application it's still running on top of windows basically um inside linux so it's kind of containerized if you like which kind of is the flavor of the month isn't it well i suppose so but that surely isn't the point of containerization is it to to just you know it's basically running in wine isn't it yeah a fancy version of wine um it's how everybody else wants to go, isn't it? I, I know containerization in our world generally has sort of native calls back to the kernel and the kernel sits outside the container, but that's not how everything's set up. And I mean, the whole software ecosystem is getting increasingly hacked together like this, where you've got whole stacks running separate from each other. And I, I don't recognize your characterization of this as particularly hacky because it's the way Linux itself is going, it would seem to me, from what a lot of companies are doing and the way that Linux is taking us. What? So just because Linux is turning into an ugly hack, this isn't an ugly hack? 
I didn't say that. I said in comparison, you're, you're trying to make out that Linux is some wondrous shining castle on the hill or something. I'm mixing my metaphors horribly there, but no, it, it's one way of doing it, and it means less work for them because it's portable and makes a lot of sense, and the same arguments can apply to software distribution that we're seeing in our world. Well, okay, fair enough. But you say it makes a lot of sense, but does SQL Server on Linux make any sense at all when you've got so many other databases that are available? I mean, it, it, does it really offer anything that the likes of MySQL and, and the others do on Linux, given that a lot of the advanced features of SQL Server are not available on Linux? They're only available on the Windows version. Yeah, they haven't been rolled out yet, have they? I'd say, though, one of the biggest costs, when we always focus on cost of software, one of the biggest costs in running software is the human cost and the, the training cost and getting everyone familiar with a product and porting stuff over. And if you're running a mixed environment and you've got some SQL servers out there running on top of Windows, I can't see why it wouldn't make sense to be running it on top of Linux as well. But that doesn't sound like it's in Microsoft's interest for them to facilitate people to move over to Linux. It sounds like an admission of defeat, almost. Yeah, it sounds like they've more or less given up on the operating system side of things. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, quite happily accepting that Linux has got a place in the cloud. And it's the application layer and all the bits and bobs set on top of the operating system they're interested in. Well, if there are some Windows users who are interested in learning how the, the basic Linux is working... The Humble Bundle has come to your rescue. So they've got a Humble Book Bundle, and it's a whole load of Unix books that you can uh, you know, get for whatever you decide to donate. So a minimum of a dollar, you get Unix in a nutshell, said Nork, Bash, Linux Pocket Guide, and Lex and Yak, Y-A-C-C. I have never heard of either of those. Please enlighten me. Well, you wouldn't have unless you're actually um, writing passes and such like. Okay, it seems like, given the other ones are so well-known and approachable, if you've you know dabbled in Linux for a bit, it seemed odd to have such a, such a specific one. Um, and then there's another layer of books if you pay $8 or more, and there's sort of bash and shell scripting and things. So if you've been looking for a good reference guide, the O'Reilly set of books are absolutely brilliant. And so have a look over at uh, Humble Bundle. $8 is worth it. Uh, for learning GNU Emacs third edition alone, surely. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a book, it's intuitive, surely. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, just read the man page. <laughs> yeah, so by the time this show will actually air, um, you'll have a week or so to go and buy these. So if you're looking for some stocking fillers for Christmas, it seems ideal to me. And sticking on the positive front, um, FlightAware is the world's largest flight tracking data company, and they're also a heavy user of open source. And they seem to do things the right way, and they contribute code right back into the community. And amongst other things, they seem to be using a lot of TCL, and I insist on calling it TCL. Anyone calls it Tickle deserves a slap like anyone calls it. <laughs> a, a slap a, and a tickle. GIF, a yeah, GIF. slap and tickle, that's what slap I was Slap and tickle, yeah, okay. Um, and the reason I'm talking about them is they've offered some really generous bounties uh, to beef up TCL and add in some new features. And I'll put a link in the show notes if this is something you'd like to follow up on. And I thought it was really good to see an organisation other than Linux Foundation or Mozilla poning up some really sensible amount of money here to help improve free and open source code. Yeah, I mean, the cynical view might be that it's in their own interest because they're going to get some quality code, but that's how these things should work. I'm slightly speechless at the idea that you could put a cynical spin on a company wanting people to improve the code that they're using. It, it just seems purely natural. Well, yeah. Uh, exactly. I mean, I, I'm just playing devil's advocate to be cynical. But yeah, I mean, it, all I'm saying is they're not doing it for the good of the community or anything. They're doing it because it's in their interest. But the beauty of open source software is that what is their interest is also the interest of everyone. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, I have a slight soft spot for FlightAware because I've played with the software and uh, dump 1090 and things like this on the Raspberry Pi where you put a little uh, RTLD rtld i think so a usb stick with a aerial on it and you can track the planes and things so uh, living on a, one of the flight paths of heathrow from f slightly further out uh, i get to see some of the planes go over and it's quite quite interesting just to see what's flying over the top so yeah it has a soft spot for me well you mentioned mozilla there paddy and we've mentioned the mozilla secure open source program before which is an initiative to give money to projects to have them 
audited, to have their code audited. And that's exactly what's happened with curl. Now, curl isn't something that you would think that you use very often, but it is used by a lot of applications, isn't it? It's kind of pretty core to a lot of how Linux works. And so it was a good idea for this to be audited. And there were some bugs in it that were found that have been fixed, which is pretty good news. Well, this isn't the first program that we've heard about uh, with Mozilla funding the audit, but it is a very, very well-known and often used command. And so surely these are the sorts of commands that we should be auditing before we get onto all the sort of more complicated stuff down the line, get the, the fundamental ones which are used most often, get a new pair of eyes on them and, and check that they're running well. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think you're right that before you go after the complicated stuff, why not start with the simple ones? But I have to question the choice of the company who they used for this, simply because uh, at the bottom of this blog post by Daniel Stenberg about this, he says, just because we got our hands on a full audit report doesn't mean that the world stops, right? While working on the issues one by one to have them fixed, we also ended up getting an additional four security issues to add to the set by three independent individuals. Which means that although the code for curl was audited, this company missed four bugs. So they kind of done a very good job. Can they? Yeah, it kind of looks that way. And the other aspect of this, which I always bang on about, which to everyone is annoyance, is that it's all well and good having these audits done and fixing stuff. But if you carry on then adding features and making changes to the code, you are just reintroducing new bugs. So security audits are great if it's on a piece of code that ain't likely to change in the near future. Well, it sounds like you're advocating frequent code audits rather than just we've done that, that's it, it's done now. Oh, you're twisting my words, you evil man. <laughs> well, no, what you're really saying is stop feature creep and all the rest of it, but people are going to do that. Developers are going to develop, as I always say. And if they're going to do it, then you're going to have to keep auditing it. Surely that's the only solution. Yeah, there's a whole other industry there ready to spring into life, isn't there? If only I knew how to audit code. Oh, well. Well, sticking with Linux security, and there's been a vulnerability in the way in which Lux hard disk encryption works. And this has been in since kernel 2.6. And basically, when the machine is booting, if you hold down the enter key, it's that simple, it will get to the maximum number of attempts at in entering the password to decrypt the hard disk, and then will just drop to an init RAM FS shell. And so once you're there, you're in the initialization stage, and therefore you've got uh, root access. So you can get hard access to the machine and just hold down, hold down a return. You can actually get in, and then while obviously Lux hasn't been decrypted, so you've still got encrypted files on your disk, you could potentially do more nefarious stuff, either setting up a network and copying the files off or, you know, DDing the whole disk, what have you, so that you can then uh, bash on that and try and break the encryption. Machines owned in physical access shocker. Don't we always say that if you've got physical access to it, all bets are off anyway? So does it really matter? There are other ways to do this. Yeah, I was trying to think about a sensible case here where you would have some physical access to the machine. You obviously need a keyboard and some means of powering it on and off. But as you say, I mean, if you've got full access, you can always whip out disks and do all sorts of things to them. And the only thing I could think of was kiosks where you potentially got access to a, a plug that goes into the wall and also a keyboard. But how many kiosks are Lux encrypted? I, I really don't know. Yeah, but normally with a kiosk, they sort of fit and forget, aren't they? So if the power goes out or someone, for some reason, you know, they, they fail and reboot or whatever, do you, you want them to boot straight back up to whatever working interface they should have, not waiting for the passkey to decrypt the encrypted drive? You want them just to boot straight through. So you're unlikely to have encrypted hard disks on them in the first place. Yeah, that was my thought as well. So I really don't see this as a massive issue, other than the fact it's another example of many eyes obviously weren't looking at the code, or if they were, they've, they've totally failed to see the vulnerability. And it's just a, a story we hear again and again. Well, I found it eventually. <laughs> it might have took them a while, but, you know, if it was in some proprietary software, it could have remained unseen for even more, twice as long or more. Yeah, fair enough. 
Anyway, just sticking on security for one more story, or maybe a couple, but we'll stick with Linux at the moment. KDE. Um, on November the 14th, Jonathan Riddle posted a KDE security advisory and explained that the package archive used by KDE Neon had been incorrectly configured, which could have permitted anyone to upload packages to it. Now, obviously, this has since been fixed, as has the looks thing we were talking about a moment ago. But I wanted a little grumble about how inadequate I thought their response was. Reinstall was the <laughs> solution, or if not, we'll just bump the version number of every single package, and you can spend a couple of days updating your system. Hmm, not ideal. No, it's not ideal, but I mean, it's reasonable advice. But there's something unsaid in that, which I think is if your system actually had been compromised by dodgy packages from this repo, you really ought to consider any passwords you used and any files you had access to um, whilst running KDE Neon prior to them sorting this out, also potentially compromised. Oh, you think that they shouldn't have just assumed that people would realise that? Yeah, I mean, maybe they are making the big assumption there that anyone using KDE and Neon is savvy enough to know they're going to have to go and change all the passwords, or they really ought to, from a hygiene point of view, after this was found. But I think they maybe should have called this out, to be honest. Yeah, I suppose a little note about that would have been nice. So let's move on and talk about blue Android phones, which is BLU. And these, you see them, uh, I think, at the likes of Best Buy. It's basically cheap Android phones that are actually reasonably specced. Um, and it turns out that there's a backdoor in a lot of them. And that backdoor was ostensibly there to collect data for advertising. But it turns out that it's sending a lot of data that you wouldn't want, like stuff like call logs, text messages, the actual content of text messages, back to servers in China. And this is done via the, the firmware update software. So it makes you think, doesn't it, that you've got these various bits of proprietary software, and this is one case where it's been found to be phoning home to China with all of this data which I don't suppose they are massively interested in, but you never know. I've got a few thoughts on this, Joe, but they kind of tie in with the story that Jesse's going to tell us about as well. Okay, so I'll do that one and we can have a little wrap-up between the pair. So this is the Google are basically, although not so officially, abandoning Android 2.3 gingerbread. So if you rack your brains back uh, six years, you'll remember that's when that was released. And while they're not actually removing support for it they're saying that version uh, 10.0.0 of the google play services will be the last one to support 2.3 gingerbread which means that when google play services upreads from that one a lot of the functionality a lot of the features that um, a lot of applications use you know that pulls out information from google play services like your location and that won't work and so it sort of makes Android not as useful as it should be because more and more apps are, are pulling this information. And so if you are somehow still on a six-year-old version of Android, it might be time to think about upgrading. You say that somehow on a version of it, it's unthinkable for me, but then you think about the developing world where maybe people are, I don't know, because it's very rare that I see a phone that is older than about four-ish, you know, Android 4. Usually it's some sort of, you know, 4, 4.2, something like that. I don't think I've seen a gingerbread phone for a very, very long time. Yeah, I mean, we often talk about how short the support cycle is for the hardware. So the Nexus, whatever it has been recently, 6P or something like that, is, is dying out. You know, the Nexus 5 doesn't get support anymore. My flatmate has a Nexus 4. And so that works as far as he's concerned perfectly well. but you know, he's missing out on security updates and all these other things that we laugh at people who haven't upgraded in time. Uh, maybe I'm being remiss in not forcing him to upgrade, but, you know, phones aren't that cheap for when you want, like, a, a top-of-the-range one or have you. So he's happy sticking around with that and he knows how it works. So you can sort of see how, if you've got a tablet with gingerbread on, it you might not ever really think about upgrading it. Yeah, this covers honeycomb as well, though, doesn't it? The story you're talking about, and that's more likely to be on a tablet of that vintage. Oh, yeah, that was the tablet-specific one, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Well, that came out on the Motorola Zoom, but even that got upgraded to what was the one after Honeycomb uh, ice cream sandwich, I think. So it, you'd still be all right on that. So I, I just can't see that there's going to be that many people running these ancient versions of Android still. No, which kind of leads me back to the his story about the blue phones and such like. And also what Google are doing in the future, because they've been slowly taking more and more APIs and shoving them into play services and because it's proprietary and they, they can control the, the state of play there. And I would have thought after all these years that Android has been on the market and after the billions of phones they've sold, we really ought to be at a state where APIs and such like and some of the base code is absolutely stable and can be properly audited by people going back to another earlier story. And things like what was happening with the blue phones shouldn't be an issue because people should know exactly what stock components of the operating system are and they're consistent across devices. Sounds like you're trying to stifle innovation to me, Paddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Okay, um, let me talk about something innovative then, and that is the Pine Book. And we've talked about the immensely popular Pine A64 single board computer on the show before. And the company behind that budget device is planning to launch a cheap laptop based around the same quad core 64 bit ARM CPU and also a similar supporting chipset. And the Pine Book's going to come in 11.6 and 14 inch versions, uh, the expected retail cost of $89 and $99 respectively. Now, obviously, it's not going to be a screamer, but I think at this price point, for a really reasonable sort of small basic laptop that's running linux it could be a useful second device for an awful lot of people out there who can't afford a chromebook or as a couple of people in the comments below the article i'm going to link to suggest again it's something ideal for the developing world it looks suspiciously like a next doc doesn't it hmm it does yeah i think it's these chinese odms that uh, have got their kind of it's like a macbook air type clone but um, I suppose similar to a lot of the laptops that run Linux as well. But I don't know, you say for $99 or $89, that is pretty cheap, but it's, it's still fairly underpowered, isn't it? I mean, you're sort of still in the, the Raspberry Pi-ish territory, if a little bit beefier. It, it's not going to be a really usable machine for that. And for just a tiny bit more, you can get these Atom machines which are more tricky to run Linux on, but seem to run Windows reasonably well. And obviously we care about Linux and stuff, but if you just want a cheap laptop, most people don't care what operating system it's running. So I don't know. I mean, it it looks cool, don't get me wrong, and I would really want one. And for that kind of price, $89 for the little one, I mean, that used to be about 60 or 70 quid until you ruined this country, Paddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, now it's probably about 150 but yeah it's still fairly cheap and it's the kind of thing that i would buy to mess around with um but yeah i don't know in terms of whether it can compete with other low-end laptops atom-based ones i'm not convinced really yeah i'll be interested to see reviews when they eventually ship them um currently you have to sign up for a wait list for this and i've done so to be honest for the 11.6 inch version as you say um the small one appeals to me as well so if the reviews are good and if the pound versus the dollar, which could well have rebounded, to be honest, we could be in a better state after the Donald gets his claws into the US economy. Um, yeah, I may well go out and get one of these. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye out for that one. Um, but let's finish off with news that SUSE Linux Enterprise Server is available for the Raspberry Pi. This isn't the Pi podcast. Why are we talking about this? Well, because this is the first kind of major distro that's available for the Raspberry Pi 3 that is 64-bit. Because if you cast your mind back to when the Raspberry Pi 3 was released, the processor in it is an ARM V8, which is 64-bit capable. But in order to maintain compatibility across all of the various Raspberry Pis, the Raspberry Pi Foundation didn't make a 64-bit version of Raspbian. They just ran a 32-bit on a 64-bit chip. And so now it's taken a while and there have been some kind of hacked together things which work reasonably well, but now we've got a kind of officially supported from a reasonably big company version of Linux that's 64-bit for the Raspberry Pi 3, which has got to be good. I mean, I don't personally use SUSE myself, but 
this sounds like the kind of thing that can be built upon and adapted by other distros and hopefully we'll start to see the the full potential of the raspberry pi 3 being realized yeah well hats off to Sousa for getting there first but my understanding is that red hat and ubuntu aren't far behind anyhow whilst we're talking about raspberry pis A couple of episodes back, we heard from Paddy, who had finally switched on the Raspberry Pi 2 that I sent him. And so we thought we'll catch up with what Jesse and I have been doing with ours. Now, what I do with mine isn't going to take that long to talk about. So let's start with you, Jesse. One of the things you do is viewing photos with Lychee. Yeah, so... The main thing I use my Raspberry Pis for is sort of time-lapse photography. And when we did Foss Talk Live, I put a camera in the back corner and did a little time-lapse of that. So it's not been shared out or anything, but I just enjoy, you know, the, the challenge and, and getting it together and, and every time I think of something new to do. And so what I sort of set my goal was to have a time-lapse of seasons passing. So I got one of these Pi Zeros and there's a little sort of board that you can get that sticks the camera module and the Pi Zero together onto a window. So the idea is that the the lens of the camera is as, as close to the window, you know, butted up against the window and held on by two suction pads, and it holds the Pi Zero all together in a nice little bundle. So bought myself that on the window, and it's just taking photos out at my back window, which is uh, a flat in London, but it, the view is of sort of half dozen trees and there's some grass and a little road and what have you and not really overlooking other people or houses or what have you so uh, it's quite a, a fortunate location to just take photos and obviously seasons and things the trees are a, a vital item there because then you get the leaves coming and going but I sort of thought well while this is taking photos over time it would maybe be nice to just view a picture from my window when I'm not at home. So maybe I go away for a long weekend or go on holiday or want to share it with my mum. And, you know, what, what's it like out the back of Jesse's flat uh, this spring day or whatever? And there we go. So I'd seen Lychee. And basically, it's a self-hosted web-based photo album. So it runs on top of a lamp stack. You clone it down from GitHub. And then once you've done the setup via just going to a local host browser and doing all of the setup in there, once you've obviously set up the the database and what, all those sorts of things, you can basically say, these are the photos I want. And it's quite an elegant front end. If you just go to the, the Lychee website, sort of search for Lychee photos, what have you, and it gives you a demonstration uh, sort of site that you can move the photos around and so it does all of the hard lifting to make it look elegant for you and you just have to set up the back end so I was taking these photos and the problem is that like you won't auto sync when you've copied your photos off your Pi so I installed another program called like you sync um, also on github and then you can get that to you know once a day or every couple of hours whatever to sync up Lychee with the, the photo library and then just pick one a day. You know, just I just have my cron job run to, to pick one particular photo and stuff it up on there. And then it means that I can see the photos at the back of my window. And then obviously the end goal will be to collate all the photos together and either have some sort of time lapse of the photos over uh, day by day or sort of over a week or as the seasons change or you know depending on what period you choose and how fast the frame rates go you can make different effects as to how time passes and that's uh yeah that's my sort of slightly obscure and slightly niche use of uh, my raspberry pi i don't think it's that obscure i think a lot of people do this photography stuff with it especially the time lapses because it is so low powered isn't it especially the zero um, presumably you're just running that off a fairly low power phone charger or something. Yeah, exactly. So I would prefer to use the Pi Zero off a of battery so that when I'm doing something maybe remote, for example, when we did Foss Talk, that needed a battery, it would be useful to have a Pi Zero in that instance because then obviously it's using a lot less and that's where power is really critical. But for something that I'm leaving on all day, every day for at least a year, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to know that it's not pulling all the electricity out of my sockets. Because that's how electricity works, right? That is my understanding of it, yes. What I do with mine is a lot less involved, I suppose, hardware-wise. And the beauty of the Pi 3 is that when configured correctly, you can just have one thing plugged into it, power, and that's it. 
because it's got the Wi-Fi. And so I use mine as a server, basically, for a couple of things. Um, one, for seeding torrents, because I think it's nice to kind of give back to the community. If you are going to download ISOs, then why not just leave them seeding for a few days and kind of, you know, help out with hosting costs? And that's really easy with uh, transmission. But the kind of obscure thing is my bizarre to-do list, my convoluted to-do list, which came out of something else. So what I did was I installed WordPress and I installed PowerPress from Blueberry, which is a podcasting plugin. And so you kind of do the minimal setup on that and you create your RSS feed. And so then I've imported that RSS feed into AntennaPod. And the, the reason that I've done all that is that often people will link to an episode of a podcast and rather than just downloading it and then attempting to get it to play back in antenna pod, which is kind of hit and miss um, or just in a different music player, I want it to be in my main podcast player antenna pod. And so that's why I thought, well, if I create my own RSS feed locally, I can more or less just copy the link location of whatever it is I want to listen to, stick that into PowerPress and then it's in my own personal RSS feed. So on your podcast player, there's your little face as a sort of front end, and then you press on that, and it's got all of the randomly selected different podcasts from different places, but just one episode at a time. Well, it doesn't have my face on it because I'm not some sort of weird narcissist. It's just a <laughs> black square. But yeah, it's just it, like you've got an RSS feed for this show, for example, and you can scroll back a certain number of episodes it's just my my own RSS feed and anything that I want to chuck into there, I can either download the, the media onto the Pi or usually you can just link it remotely anyway from someone else's server. And yeah, so I've just got that all there as my own um, podcasts to listen to. And sometimes that might be stuff I've ripped off YouTube and then obviously that will have to be local. Um, but yeah, it's just a kind of nice, neat way to get it all into AntennaPod. And this is all done syncing locally, so it's not uh, out on the big wide web. It's just when you go home and and get on the Wi-Fi. Well, yeah, that's the kind of downside to it. I don't want to open my ports up. And we've had discussions many times, haven't we, about your ports being open and and ways to secure it. I think just leave it on my LAN and that's it. And so it means that when you're out and about and you refresh your feeds, you get this error saying that it obviously can't connect to it. But you get used to that and you just get rid of it. I mean... a simple way to do this would be to host it on, you know, a digital ocean droplet or something. So it was out on, on the web and you could potentially password protect the RSS feed. So no one else can get at it. But at the end of the day, it's just stuff you're listening to. And I don't suppose many people are going to be that concerned security wise about that. But one of the things in antenna pod, which incidentally is what you should be using on Android, isn't it, Paddy? It is indeed. Yes. Because it's a free software. Um, it's on um, F-Droid as well as the Play Store. Um, one of the features of it is if you subscribe to an RSS feed that doesn't have media in it, then it will just display that the, the title of the blog post and the contents of it with a little tick to say that you've read it. And so that's a kind of little known feature that most people probably aren't aware of. So... That brings me to my convoluted to-do list. So if instead of a post for a podcast showing up in, you know, as a podcast that I can download, if instead of that, I just write, you know, dentist two o'clock Friday, then that shows up. And then I can leave it as unread until I have been to the dentist at two o'clock on Friday. Now you could say, well, why don't you just use a to-do list app? There's a million of them. Well, I've tried that kind of stuff and I've tried having emails on red, but the fact is this, I look at AntennaPod more than anything else on my phone and I always am refreshing what new podcasts are available. And therefore, every time I go to that, that reminds there, you've got to go to the dentist, don't forget to go there on Friday. And so for me, it's a very convoluted way of doing it, but it's a very effective way of doing it. This is where you both laugh at me, presumably. It's just stunned silence, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, you have gone a very long way around this. But, I mean, I do see your your final point there, because I've got uh, G-Tasks and 
tasks. Oh no, Keep. So Keep and G Tasks are two apps that I have, and I have a bit of a woolly um, distinction between what I put in G Tasks and what I put in uh, Google Keep. But you're right. I have to open that app to look at what's there, unless I've set active reminders to come up in location or time, what have you. But yeah, if it's something that you constantly go to and it's always in your face, that's a really good place to have those reminders. So while the method is incredibly nerdy and laborious, it does eventually get you know it gets to the end goal, which which is showing you your reminders. It's not as laborious as it sounds. Once it's all set up, it's very easy to to keep it going and if you've ever installed wordpress before there's not much to that really so yeah maybe it is laborious i don't know maybe my standards are different from normal people's yeah and while two-thirds of this show's hosts have installed wordpress we are a podcast so it's kind of likely to have happened i'm not sure that many listeners have installed wordpress Ah, uh, maybe maybe but the fact is that that to-do list is all based on free software from WordPress to Linux that it's running on to AntennaPod on the phone. So that's why I'm claiming it as a free software win. But you had this other thing in the notes, um, an Energine Pi module. Energini. So I may have mentioned on a previous show about control of my lights in my lounge. I, I will very quickly go over it. So I don't have a main light, so I like to have lamps. And so it's annoying having to go around and turn like two or three sort of lamps on and then turn them off again and what have you. So what you can get is a little box that plugs into the wall socket and then you plug any device into that uh, adapter and you have a remote which turns these adapters on or off. And they come in a set of three. So the remote can control all three. And once you've plugged in three lamps to them and just turn the lamp switch on, you can control the lights in your room while sat on the sofa. And, you know, if you put a film on, you just turn, like, the like, the brightest one off or, or however you want it to be. So I prefer that. It has replaced my use of the main light entirely. It's brilliant. But you wanted to make it Internet of things ball. Yeah, so I redecorated my room and did exactly the same thing with subtle lights and backlights and shadow gaps, all these sorts of things. And just by, you know, chance, the one that was on... Amazon was this company called Energini. So I bought, again, three adapters that come and the remote can control all three, da-da-da. But what I noticed as well in the people also bought section, which for the one of the first times ever was actually really useful, is a, basically a Pi hat made by Energini, which goes onto the GPIO pins and there is the smaller version. So it's with the very original Raspberry Pis with the smaller number of pins. And... It basically, once you've you know trained it to to know what um, switches and sockets to turn on and off, it can do that for you. So what I now have is a cron job on this Raspberry Pi to turn certain lights on, like in the morning. So when my alarm goes off, the light also turns on. And then because I try and leave the house bang on half seven, the light turns off at half seven. So it's like a visual reminder that ah this is the time to go, I should be getting my shoes on, off we go. So it also means that because by attaching an aerial to it, just a little sort of 10 centimetre bit of wire, um, which I did the other day, the range is big enough to cover my whole flat. So what I'm tempted to do is buy a couple more of these little sockets, put them in one or two vital locations around the flat, and then you can have cron jobs and things or just little scripts that run that, you know, if you go on holiday, you can make it look like, you're you're in and by turning lights on and off and stuff but the internet of things aspect of this is that because it's only a raspberry pi and and while the raspberry pi is on my wi-fi the lights are not it's all just going over radio frequencies so it's not this like a big gaping hole of internet of things problems it's quite a you know quite a closed system which is independent of my Wi-Fi, which is independent of um, all these other things. So it's it's less likely to go wrong. I'm less likely to mess it up. Just you wait till your lights start DDoSing the DNS system. <laughs> Only, yeah, if someone hacks my Raspberry Pi and then decides that they're going to mess around with the code inside, which then controls the Energini, they may well be able to do that. But I, th- I think I'm all right at the moment. Well, it just goes to show how versatile these little machines are. And no doubt we'll have more wild and wacky things to talk about at some point in the future. 
On to the feedback then. And first of all, a huge thanks to Victor Vajberg for your PayPal donation. It's two shows in a row. Well done. Much appreciated. And uh, to our new monthly supporters, Joshua Scott, Robert Richthoff, butchered that, sorry, Diego Reyes Quintana, and Thomas Larson Vessel. I swear I've butchered every single one of your names by way of thanks but yeah much appreciated and of course to the uh, existing monthly supporters uh, it's very much appreciated everyone and just a quick reminder that when your credit card expires paypal requires you to kind of log in and sort that out otherwise um the the payments fail and we're not going to email people individually about that to nag them but i just thought it's worth flagging up here if, if that's happened to you then um yeah please do go in and sort that out for us and uh, so contact details then. You can email us show at linuxluddites.com or on Twitter at linuxluddites or there's Facebook and Google Plus communities or you can always leave a comment on the website. And before we get into the feedback proper, um, Gavin Hewins, who's been a busy gentleman spreading the word about the Hack Horsham event, is putting on a Raspberry Jam in Horsham on December the 11th. And we'll stick a link in the show notes to where you can go to find tickets and what have you for this. And apparently it's an easy uh, five-minute walk away from Horsham Station, which itself is about an hour out of side of London. So everybody down in the southeast, you've got no excuses. Get yourselves over to Horsham for that on December the 11th. Yep. And in the main feedback, we heard from David Corollo, who said, bit of a random question here. On yours and several other Linux podcasts I listen to, I generally hear voices from the Ubuntu community discussing various things. On the flip side, I rarely hear voices from the Fedora project. Does anyone else think they're missing an opportunity for some public relations by being less involved? The only reason I mention the Fedora project is that they have the backing of arguably the number one Linux company in the world. It seems like a slightly uh, odd coincidence that we're going to be covering a Fedora-based distro later on. But just to add to that, Morton got in touch and said, Agreed. I find the Fedora project considerably more interesting in terms of infrastructure and innovation. Maybe it would be an idea to bring in someone now that Fedora 25 is coming out. Now, this struck a chord with me because I listen to a lot of Linux podcasts and I'm fairly aware of what's going on in the community. And... Obviously, you hear a lot from Ubuntu people, Popey and Wimpy and that kind of thing. And you do hear from Sousa. But yeah, Fedora, there doesn't seem to be anyone getting out there and, and spreading the word about it. And it makes you wonder why that is. Is it be because they're backed by such a large company and they are confident, let's say, that they don't need to go and spread the word? Or... Or, or is it something else? Are we in like a little podcast bubble and we're just, you know, hearing people talk about the same things backwards and forwards on, on different podcasts? Whereas actually, if you look on the forums or, you know, uh, email chains, things like this, Fedora have a lot more interaction going on. Well, maybe you're right that we're in the bubble. I mean, certainly podcasts wise, it seems to be just like a, a load of mates, really, all of the uh, the big podcasts. Uh, I'd like to think we're accounted in that. <laughs> you never know. We, but... we made it onto the system AU one, didn't we? Yeah, true, true. Oh, sorry. Yet another mention. Yeah, stop plugging them. They seem to be just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but while Popey and Wimpy both work for Ubuntu, I I struggle to think that they are being paid to go onto podcasts and you know do those podcasts. They're doing it because they're involved and they enjoy it and you know of course they spread the word of ubuntu in doing so because they're so um intimately involved so there's no reason that someone from fedora wouldn't be that intimately involved and decide to go onto podcast i mean it's not i'm saying what i'm saying is not like ubuntu have said we must have advocates out there you two have been chosen or you three or four have been chosen out you go it just sort of happens that there's people in the community who you know are interesting to listen to and and are working on things that people want to know about. Well, I think it's rather the other way around, isn't it? It's that they, Popey certainly was out there advocating for Ubuntu as a community member and then got a job as a result of it. All right, well, that uh, clears it, yeah. In which case, let's move it on. And you were talking about 3D printing last time, Jesse. And Victor got in touch and said, I thought I could try to share some information about 3D printing with Linux. Blender is a powerful 3D design program. However, it isn't beginner-friendly and probably takes years to master. FreeCAD takes second place, 
an open SCAD, which I think is how you pronounce it, is very, very popular with its parametric way of designing objects. Whilst Blender is best for organic and artistic works, FreeCAD or OpenSCAD are easily better for mechanical objects. Tinkercad is also easy and a very popular online-only app that's worth checking out. Things are much better when it comes to the slicing software. These applications are slicing 3D models and as an output produce a file the 3D printer reads with all the instructions to print the model. Most of the slicers are available on Linux, including Cura, Slicer and Simplify 3D. If you want to browse and download thousands of free 3D models, you can't go wrong with Thingiverse. Now there's lots of buzzwords and named products in there I'm not familiar with, apart from Blender obviously. Have you come across these, Jesse? So FreeCAD I certainly have, and I used it oh, probably three or so years ago. Uh, a friend and I were designing a telescope, but we'll just uh, put that to one side. And it was quite clunky, and we went back to using uh, Autodesk on Windows. It worked. We knew how to use it. It was fine. OpenSCAD I haven't heard of, but uh, I'm interested to have a little look. I did look at Tinkercad, and it's basically an entirely online CAD resource, uh, a little bit like that. Google SketchUp, I think it was called, that you could sort of make some basic objects and, you know, take slices and, and extrude and things like this. So I guess there's then a way of downloading that object locally, although how you'd maybe look at it to make sure it was ready to send up to uh, some sort of 3D printing organization, I'm not sure. So yeah, I've heard of those. But when it comes to the slicing software, it does seem that open source software is what both Linux, obviously, and Windows tends to use. Um, so we heard from Nathan Wolf, who also went through uh, a number of applications that he uses. And he uh, basically was saying that a lot of work he does is on Windows, but actually it uses these same uh, slicing software like Cura and Slicer and Simplify 3D. So Nathan said, I work for an appliance manufacturer as a product designer, so I spend 90% of my day with my face in CAD. Unfortunately, I do all my work on a Windows machine. When I have done CAD work in Linux, I've used FreeCAD, but the interface seems a bit clunky. Nothing gets program, but could really use a bit more refinement in sketcher mode. The 3D printer I'm the caretaker of is an Ultimaker 2 Plus Extended. It has a heated build plate and the plastic I generally use is PLA. The allegation that PLA produces low strength products is not completely accurate. Depending on the shape and how you print it, it can be sturdy, but it's all in how you slice the object. I've made replacement parts for my kids' toys, and they seem to hold up, depending on the part made, of course. The ABS parts I've printed off as a structural replacement component has held up and works pretty well. I mostly use the 3D printer to test fit and function of parts as proof of concept. So I've sort of cut a bit from Nathan where he um, doubles up on, on what Victor says, but he does reflect the same point that I was making, that a lot of the CAD software on Windows just tends to be better or at least more usable whereas when it comes to slicing he was also advocating a lot of these open source tools so thanks both of you for getting in touch it was really useful to to have that information uh, i also heard from brian who sent us a couple of links to podcasts that have been done relating to 3d printers so we'll pop those in the show notes too yeah and that'll do with the feedback then let's move on well, we've talked quite a lot about Fedora already on this show, particularly Fedora 25 that's recently been released. And back on episode 72, we looked at Corora 23, which is a derivative of Fedora that's designed to make it easier and have stuff working out the box and, and just generally kind of polish it a little bit. And Jesse saw that Chapeau 24 was on the DVD that came with his Linux magazine, which is a similar project to Corora. So we thought, we'll have a look at that. And whilst the timing might seem a little odd, traditional wisdom with Fedora is you go a release behind. So with 25 just about to hit the streets, and it has now, um, it seems perfectly reasonable to look at a version based on 24. So the first difference between Corora and Chapeau that struck me was that it's just GNOME. With Corora, you've got all these different flavors, and I think I looked at Cinnamon and... Uh, one of us looked at Marte, I think. Whereas with Chapo, it is what it is. It's very similar to standard Fedora in as far as you get GNOME 3. Yeah, and of course, there are different spins of Fedora, but the main version, as you suggest, is GNOME-based. And I thought the website for Chapo was nice. It was clean. It looked attractive. And 
with it only having the one desktop and only supporting 64-bit, uh, there was a download link. That was a button to click, and that was it. So there was none of this trying to work out which version you're actually interested in and sorting through menus or anything. It was very straightforward to get hold of. And like standard Fedora, it uh, works fine in a live environment, doesn't it? Well, as Joe pointed out there, the part of the reason we're looking at this is that it came on the DVD that was with Linux Magazine that we talked about on the last show. And as such, I did think I would just put the DVD in my drive and, and load it onto a hard disk from my main PC. But I generally tend to test things on my laptop. So I did download the ISO and I thought I'd just look at it in a virtual box. And I don't know whether it was because I wasn't concentrating. I have to admit there was some TV in the background because when you're installing things, that just takes a long time. But it didn't seem to work. It it lost the mouse and it wasn't responsive. I don't know if either of you had it or whether I was just being foolish because I wasn't giving it my full attention. It's certainly sluggish. I mean, it's like Corora and Fedora itself. It's not virtual box aware, which doesn't pose too much of a problem depending on your screen size. Um, I sp- Ban this up in a virtual box and also on hardware. And while in VBox, um, I'm having to scroll the actual window to get to the bottom of the installation menus and things like that. So it'd be handy, as we've said previously, if things could be virtual box aware, because a lot of people download an ISO and try it before committing to hardware, particularly if it's using an installer they're not familiar with and are perhaps a little unsure about. And even though I am familiar with Anaconda, it it, it gives me the heebie-jeebies any time I go anywhere near it. Oh, yes. Even on my test laptop, where it doesn't ultimately matter if I delete various partitions, but I still want to keep a Ubuntu partition just to have something that I know is solid. And it, it, it really, I don't know, it's it's just terrible, isn't it? Uh, I feel bad saying it, but, but this Anaconda installer has been in Fedora for a number of releases now, and it just never gets any better does it it's reached perfection so why have you changed it (laughs) i mean is it just because i'm so familiar with ubiquity that i feel that that is streets ahead Uh, and is it because having that much power means you have that much complexity with the the various raid options and all that kind of stuff or or is it just terrible it's just terrible and we've talked about it before so let's not sort of spend too long on it. But I mean, the basic problems with it are it's non-linear, whereas its installation is a linear process. Um, Buttons are in different places. They're either at the top left hand or bottom right hand of the screen, depending on the window you're in at the time. So they can vary and you haven't got a consistent experience there. Um, Yeah, it's not a good installer. They obviously think it's the mutts nuts because they keep sticking it in there and keep going with it. But I don't think anyone who isn't immensely familiar with it would be happy with it, particularly the disk partitioning side of things, as you suggest. It it is a little bit scary. Mm. Well, okay, once you've fought your way through it, though, it takes an awfully long time, doesn't it, even on your fancy new SSD? It does, yes, which is something I've experienced previously with any sort of Fedora-based or any Anaconda-based install. Oh, well, that's not what I was getting at. For me... Installing normal Fedora is relatively quick, but it's because there's so much bloat in this or, okay, so many great applications to choose from once you've got it installed out of the box. It's a big download. It takes a long time. And I've just got in my notes here, bloat to the max. So prior to this review, I did listen back to episode 72 the, in which we looked at Corora. And yeah, there are some similar comments about the installer on my view. And that had what you claim was a lot of software. Yeah, but this is even worse, isn't it? Yeah, this has multiple bits of software that seem to do the same thing. It's not, it is nowhere near as bad as some that we've seen, which have had like seven different browsers and you think, trim it down. And now I've said that, I realise I'm basically mirroring what we said in 72. But it, it does, well, actually, I think what the problem is, is it's a little bit like with Android. This was my conclusion. So, once you get through the install and, and you're to the GNOME desktop, you type in music and it has GNOME music as well as Rhythmbox. And then you type in photos and it's got Shotwell as well as GNOME photos. Uh, you type in documents and it's got LibreOffice as well as GNOME documents. And you kind of think in the same way that Android has their default application and then whoever it is your provider will put their 
extra application on as well. So you end up with two and having to choose. This seems to have the same thing, but it's not so much the fault of the operating system. It's the fault of GNOME insisting that it's part, you know, part of its package is its own music player, its own video player, its own this, that, and the other. And then they put what they think is the preferred one, whether it be Rhythmbox or LibreOffice. And, and you end up with this sort of collision because you've got two of everything. And as you said, that takes a long time to install. Can I just bring up the point of OpenShot? Now, OpenShot is my preferred video editor because I like things nice and simple. I have very simple needs. But why would you install that by default? It just makes no sense to me. Put it in your app store as recommended application or whatever in the in the video or multimedia section. But when you're getting to the point where you've got OpenShot installed, that that is just bloat. There's no two ways about it. But if it wasn't there, things like that weren't there, would there actually be any point to a distribution like Chapo? I mean, it sets up some extra repos for you, like RPM Fusion and what have you. So you're not, not having to do that. But apart from the extra software and some of the configuration, which we can talk about, it doesn't add an awful lot more other than the software. Well, not even visually. Compared to Fedora, it's not massively different, is it? I spun up Corora quickly, and that's got new mix icons and, and generally has a, a very different look from Fedora. Whereas Chapeau just feels, as you say, that they've, they've taken Fedora, they've added a lot of software to it, but not a huge amount else. No, as far as I could tell, the only thing produced by themselves that I saw installed default out of the box was their hardware tool. They've got something that um, just pulls together various messages from parts of the system so you can see what hardware you've got. But you are really just looking at a preponderance of software packages that they've, they've put on this. Having said that, they have done some good configuration, I think, in places. Um, things like GIMP being set to be in single window mode, for instance, out of the box. I feel so divided about a single window mode in GIMP because for years I hated the fact that you had all these windows everywhere and I heard about single window mode and I had to wait a little while to get it because of being stuck on an LTS. And then I finally got it, enabled it, and I was like, mm, don't like this. It just feels wrong. I'm used to the windows being everywhere. So I'm conflicted about that shall we say but at least they are making an effort to configure things like that in in their own way yeah and perhaps that's not a good example for me to pick because again i guess they use a larger monitor when they're configuring all these things because single window mode didn't actually fit on my screen um on my laptop in using gimp and gimp is one of those applications where if you sling it to the top of the screen and you expect it to full screen, which most GNOME aware applications do, it doesn't. So yeah, you end up dragging stuff around to actually get it to fit properly. But they've done all sorts of little odd things like that, like um, including an open terminal here option in the files browser and uh, working Dropbox integration, which actually did work. Yeah, on top of Dropbox, if we're looking at software they've included, they also have Steam and Play on Linux. And so I opened up Steam, it does a small download, log in, everything works fine. So they have not only included software, but also made sure that it, you know, they've set it up properly, made sure that it works smoothly with the system. Weird gaming is something that really jumped out at me. And that seems to be one of their main focuses here, because you've got Wine and Play on Linux, and Steam, as you mentioned, so it's heavily focused on gaming, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder about heavily focused on gaming but certainly they've they've they're aware that there's a crowd out there who want these things ready set up and they or maybe just the developer has an interest in that arena and and decide to put them both in for you know his own interests we're mostly talking about the front end here and things that users see there have been a few small changes at the back end um i noticed for instance se linux was set to permissive rather than enforcing which is the standard in fedora but there did seem to be relatively little of that going on, to be fair. Most of it is the user-facing side of things, I noticed that changed applications, obviously, and things like GNOME Tweak Tool being pre-installed. Perhaps a little bit prematurely brings me to my question for you guys, which is whenever we see a distro like this, we ask the question, should it be a distro? Because I could easily see, looking at the code they've got up on GitHub, which provides all the sort of information about how they've done what they've done, 
this could be a script. You install Fedora, you run a script, and you end up with Chapeau, as opposed to a separate distribution in its own right. I was certainly struggling to distinguish what this had above a Fedora install with a couple of tweaks. I feel with Corora, uh, we came to the conclusion that it had enough differences that it felt like uh, its own distro. Whereas this, I was really going around thinking I was just in Fedora and I was using DNF and you know GNOME type tools that I, I associate with Fedora because that's so integrated. And I would therefore agree. I, I'm not sure it is an entire distro's worth of changes. Yeah, I think I'm inclined to agree, really. It, it feels bad to say it because someone's put a lot of effort into this. But yeah, it could just be some scripts to add to Fedora. But it's funny you mentioned DNF, because using that again, it makes me think, I do really like DNF. It feels quicker than apt, and it feels really intuitive. I actually listened back to um, 72 as well, and I'd said the same thing, that it's really intuitive. It's just DNF update, DNF install, VLC or whatever. But my pro tip for someone who's never used Fedora before is don't do DNF auto remove because it just balks everything. <laughs> so not so intuitive. Or at least at least you knew the command. But I took your advice from seventy two, given that you said how in, how intuitive DNF was, and I wanted to install. Oh, it was to have um, extended fat work because I plugged in a USB drive and. Why is it that no operating systems out of the box ever have fat support? It annoys me so much. So I needed to know what to install. And I know that on Ubuntu, it's XFAT utils and XFAT fuse. And so I installed XFAT utils. That was fine. XFAT fuse, no. So I did a search. And all I did was, well, you know, Joe says it's intuitive. So I just did DNF search XFAT. There you go. It's fuse.xfat, not XFAT dash fuse. So found it, installed it, everything works smoothly. So you are right, it is intuitive. It's just search, install, update. It's fairly easy. Yeah, it's, it is. Uh, it's interesting, though, you both seem to think it's reasonably fast because it was horribly slow in my box. Um, the other thing I was wanting to ask you about DNF, though, and the update process generally is how do you feel about the update process? I mean, the fact that it's a Windows-style reboot and do the updates offline. Oh, I was hoping we wouldn't have to talk about this. Uh, yeah, why you you don't have to do that if you do DNF update, but if you update with the GUI, then it says, right, we're going to reboot and do it now. I'm like, well, no, this is Linux. We don't need to do this. I'll reboot afterwards if necessary. I just don't understand why they would do that. Yeah, I'd heard about it in the weeds and the whispers and what have you, that this is a, a thing that Fedora does. And when I, when I realized it was about to happen, I thought, oh, well, I'll do it some other... Oh, no, okay, this is happening, and off it goes. And what really annoyed me was that it said, we'll restart your computer, it'll take about 60 seconds to update your files and applications, what have you, and then you'll be back in. It must have taken five, ten minutes. I got bored of waiting. It was ridiculous how long it took. It, it, now that I think about it, it really did feel like updating Windows. Do not turn off your computer or unplug it. Updates in progress. Yeah, yeah, all that nonsense, yeah. Well, still on the topic of updates and the question of how different this is actually from Fedora and how much has been changed. I don't know if either of you two tried, but I actually went in and did a DNF upgrade from Fedora 24 as the base to Fedora 25, which obviously only came out a couple of days ago. And everything carried on working quite happily afterwards, which just kind of reiterates the point. There isn't a great deal on top here that isn't stock Fedora. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. So um, bringing this to an end then, the usual question is, are you going to continue to use it? I have already removed it from my <laughs> SSD. Are you two going to continue to use it? Well, for me, the alternative background uh, desktops that they have kind of summarizes it because they basically have the standard GNOME or Fedora desktops, and then they have an alternative one which has the Chapeau logo on it. And that's all it is, is it's sort of a Fedora GNOME install with some Chapeau logos knocking around. And I'm not sure it's enough for me or other people to to see the difference. And so, no, it's, it's certainly not uh, sticking around for very long. And not for me either, I'm afraid. Uh, 
you all know my feelings on Fedora. It, it simply doesn't have a long enough support cycle for my liking and um, forever changing with things underneath the hood, which I'm not too keen on. And I think like both of you, chapeau, it, it looks really nice, to be fair. I think they've done a good job on some of the tweaking of applications, so they've got more sensible defaults than you normally see out of the box. But that's all it is, is tweaking. And as I said earlier, I can't see why it couldn't just be a script that's run on top of stock Fedora. And if you like Fedora and GNOME, you'll probably be really happy with it. But if you don't, and I don't, then no, nope, I'm afraid not for me. Yeah, maybe if you like Fedora and GNOME and you're a gamer and you want loads of applications out of the box, it would make sense. But I think that's a pretty niche corner case, isn't it? But with that, we come to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us at show at linuxluddites.com, find us on Twitter at Linux Luddites, or at the Google Plus and Facebook communities, or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Paddy and Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Au revoir. See you later.